Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Butts Along and O'Keefe's webinar, Practical and Legal Aspects of Restructuring Strategies in a Financial Crisis. During this afternoon's presentation, please feel free to submit questions to the presenters using the GoToWebinar question panel. Our presenters will answer as many questions as they can at the end of the webinar, time permitting. Also, a copy of this presentation will be made available this afternoon on both the Butzel.com Coronavirus Resource Center and the O'Keefe website. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to introduce Patrick O'Keefe from O'Keefe. Pat? Good afternoon. I'm Pat O'Keefe, the founder and CEO of O'Keefe, a strategic and transactional financial advisory firm specializing in turnaround consulting, debt restructuring, and crisis management. I have also served as the Detroit Chapter President and International Board Member for the Turnaround Management Association. We are getting many questions from business owners who have practical concerns. We are hoping today to address some of those concerns. Every day the business landscape is changing and the financial markets have yet to stabilize, although much relief is being discussed and some already implemented. Today's topic is practical and legal aspects of restructuring strategies in a financial crisis. We have an experienced panel of experts from the consulting firm O'Keefe and law firm of Butzel who have worked through many crisis situations. We thought it was important to address not only the legality of some of the financial decisions business owners are considering, but the practicality of those decisions in a crisis environment. We have allocated 40 minutes today for discussion among the panel on key options, concerns, and possible courses of action. We have reserved 20 minutes at the end for your questions. It is most likely we won't get to all of your questions and may have a need for round two as new issues and courses of action arise. It is not our intention to comment today on each slide, although it is there for your review at the end of the webinar on our respective websites. There is no need to go through the background of how we got here, since it is well documented. So we will devote most of our time to our subject matter. But first, I would like to introduce our panel, who some have claimed to have a face for webinars. Russell Long, the partner and managing director of O'Keefe, who is the past president of the Turnaround Management Association and chief operating officer of Grow Michigan, a MES fund supported by 16 Michigan banks and the Michigan Strategic Fund, to assist growing businesses in Michigan. Tom Radom is a partner practicing in Butzel Long's Bloomfield office. Mr. Radom has extensive experience in bankruptcy, corporate reorganizations and restructurings, workouts and liquidations. He has represented a variety of clients, including business debtors, automotive suppliers, bankruptcy trustees, liquidation trustees, and official committees of unsecured creditors. He is joined on the legal side by Max Newman, who is also a partner in Butzel Long's Bloomfield Hills office. Mr. Newman concentrates his practice in the representation of debtors, creditor committees, creditors, and customers in all aspects of Chapter 11 reorganizations. Mr. Newman has handled bankruptcy matters throughout the country. Our first topic that I'm gonna turn to my partner, Russ Long, to discuss our cash flow issues. Thanks, Pat. Obviously, in this troubled environment, cash is king. And the first thing you need to do is figure out how much cash you have to work with and where you can uh, look for to gain more cash. First, by assessing your undrawn lines of credit, if you have availability on your lines of credit, that would be a first choice. It's, it's there before the bank turns off the spigot. Uh, in the news yesterday, GM drew down $16 billion on their lines of credit throughout the world in order to shore up their cash position to allow them to, to uh, continue to operate in this troubled environment. Secondly, maybe determine what customers are likely to pay. Are you a critical vendor? Will they, if you're not, then more than likely they will not pay. Identify opportunities for quick sales of non-core assets. That might be a little difficult in today's environment as with everybody shut in in Michigan. And then do you have the option to incentivize customers to pay? 
maybe a, a prepayment for, if you're a critical vendor, maybe a prepayment. Also potential discounts for early pay. And then you have to calculate how you're gonna use the cash. You have to identify your critical vendors uh, to, to determine what parts you have to have to continue to supply your product to your customer. Um, in, in this troubled time, communication is the key. Negotiations are much easier when everything is current as opposed to when, when uh, it's too late to fix a problem. And then you have to determine what labor force you're going to need to produce the products that you need. Uh, in most cases, with the auto companies shut down, do you still have a customer? Are they still accepting product? So the practical matters on who do we have to pay? Employees are first. Uh, you have to determine one, what employees do you have to have, and then determine a strategy to reduce that force as much as possible. Health insurance in the current environment is required. Critical vendors, who's gonna to continue to supply you with the parts you need in order to move forward? And then who can you stretch? I'm gonna turn that back over to Pat to to talk about the various ways that you might be able to stretch your various creditors. So in, in this area, we find that a, a lot of our um, clients and, and corporations that we deal with really don't know all the options that they have in order to stretch their cash flow as far as possible. Um, the first issue is landlords, which we're going to get into some discussion today as to what options both landlords and tenants have in terms of the payments of, of rent. Uh, usually rent is a big number. Um, we've seen restructured deals where um, payments are not made for a period of time and tacked onto the back end. And it starts with requesting uh, relief from your landlord. In many cases today, um, it, it's not like there's another tenant in waiting for your space. And most landlords would like to keep you there under some level of circumstances. The reality is, is they don't have uh, availability to the courts um, today for uh, you know notices to evict. And so having a conversation with the landlord is a, a good first option. Secondly, utilities, many of the utilities that you're gonna deal with have the ability to spread your bills. Again, it's a communication that needs to be had. Don't assume that uh, the utilities are willing to stretch, you don't wanna be finding out that they've turned off um, your electricity. Again, have a conversation. I'm sure they're inundated with it, but our clients are seeing the opportunity to spread um, existing bills over several months. Property taxes in and of themselves have a mechanism for the delayment of payment. There's usually an interest rate attached to that, um, but that is also an opportunity to not use necessary cash. We're gonna talk in, in some more depth later in the discussion today on banks and, and what's available. Again, uh, what we're seeing is that if you move quickly with a well thought plan, the banks do have some flexibility today to provide um, necessary uh, relief. And uh, again, it's being offered to those people that, that come forth. Some of the easy things that can be done is uh, the deferral of principal payments. Most of the banks are still going to ask for interest, but if you have term debt, um, you have the ability to defer the principal probably anywhere from three to six months, at least today. That period of time may go longer depending on how this, uh, how long uh, this level of stress continues. Equipment leases, again, not unlike your landlord, um, you know, we've had conditions <laughs> through other crises where we've had um, a lot of lease heavy equipment in plants where we have contacted lessors and given them the option of either picking their equipment up or giving a 12 month lease deferral. And we would extend the lease by an additional year beyond that. Now, again, when faced with uh, picking up equipment, which there is a cost to, and liquidating the equipment in a very soft market, and then if they have the right pursuing a deficiency, against a borrower or lessee who's on the verge of going out of business, it's not a real practical solution for the lessor. And um, in one particular case, we 
had every lessor to essentially stand down and adopt the plan for this um, lease deferral. And the company today um, thrives very successfully in, in grew, but you know, they were faced with a, it was a foraging company and they were faced with an industry meltdown. And today I don't think anybody can argue that we're in a similar situation amongst all industries. And then, you know, change in payment terms with your non-critical vendors. I mean, a lot of companies that are used to paying uh, bills on a net 30 basis, and, uh, you know, you should consider stretching them out to 60 or 90 days, depending on uh, what you can do, or, you know, make partial payments and enter some payment plans, uh, again, with some of the existing debts. All those are viable um, strategies that you have um, going forward. The question comes up when you start, you know, breaking terms or changing terms is, you know, what's the legal implications of that? And Max, you know, what legal recourse do landlords have when they don't get paid? So, um, and, and I'll try to focus this on, on the practical aspects of the current crisis. Um, a landlord can do one of two different things um, during the course of dealing with a tenant that is not paying rent. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking now um, of, of trying to remove a tenant, not negotiating with them. Obviously, they have that option as well. But they can attempt to terminate the lease or they can attempt to evict the tenant. And they are, they are different and they have different legal consequences. One thing I will mention is that terminating a lease means that you cannot later assume it in a bankruptcy case. So it is something that uh, perhaps is more dangerous to the tenant than an eviction proceeding. With that said, um, currently the landlord process, they have to give notice to quit or notice to terminate to the tenant. Both of those have time frames on them. Uh, here in Michigan, at least, the courts are operating on a very minimal basis at the moment. Um, and so the landlord has to wait for you to default. They have to issue the notice to you, which gives you 15 to 30 days then they have to commence a what's called a summary eviction proceeding. Um, you have a period of time, 10 to 15 days to respond to it. And if you have a defense uh, of any sort to, to the rent claim, you have the right to ask for a jury trial. I think I can state reasonably that uh, at the moment, uh, no juries are going to be impaneled in the state of Michigan in the next couple of months. Um, what will happen at that point is, depending on the nature of your defense, the court may order you to start escrowing rent, but even that is a 45 to 60 day process before they start requiring you to get um, escrow rent going forward. Um, if you are shut down because of the government order and you do not have access to the premises, you have a defense against an eviction action. If uh, if it's impossible for you to operate, legally impossible for you to operate from the rented facilities and they're, and they're not available to you, um, obviously the landlord ability to collect rent from you is minimized. So there is a lot you can do, uh, but, they are, but they are claims that have to be uh, focused on because if you don't take action, the court system is operating enough to lead to an order of eviction. Thanks, Max. That's a good good recap of some of the options in, in dealing with uh, with your landlord. Uh, Russ, relative to employees, what are some of the strategies there? Sure. Obviously, you lay off the non-essential employees first, and then you make a decision on what to do with the balance. If you have the ability to continue to work and you haven't been forced to shut down, you can furlough employees for a specific period of time and then revisit it later. You can move people to part-time option. So there's a, a rotating, potentially a rotating staff that still allows you to operate, but everybody's on a part-time basis. And another option is to reduce the wages and benefits for a period of time and then revisit it as, as the environment that we live in changes. The Turnaround Management Association, uh, way back when, did a uh, survey and study that said employees when faced with a potential 20% reduction in workforce or a 20% reduction in pay, opted for the 20% reduction uh, in pay because of the certainty of still having a job 
um, going forward. So I think, you know, when you're thinking about what your options are, everybody values their employees and sees the need to keep a, uh, a workforce intact, but the practicalities of not having the cash flow to do that, um, sometimes reducing wages and benefits is a good alternative. But Tom, I, I guess the, the question I have is, you know, what is the, the legal risk if you get in situations where you can't pay payroll? Well, uh, Pat, uh, it's important to understand that uh, employee payroll is governed and regulated by federal and state law that mandates payment of payroll, or at least in the case of non-exempt employees, payment of minimum wage. Uh, the failure to pay payroll can result in civil penalties. Also, there could be personal liability if the, uh, for company officials who are in charge of payroll decisions. So the point here is, is that in the course of your restructuring activities, decisions as to who to pay, it's important to understand that to avoid liability and potential personal liability for failure to pay payroll, that the company take prompt action uh, as Russ said, to either lay off or furlough employees. And uh, if you're going to keep employees on the payroll, uh, to consider a uh, reduction of work hours or reduction of wages. Now, but, let me just, let me just uh, complete this uh, one discussion here by saying, this is a 30,000 foot overview on payroll issues. And you have other employee issues that are arising in the context of new federal legislation, such as the family, uh, Paid Leave Act, and I would recommend because there these these new these new uh, uh, laws are very complicated to consult with your lawyer or to pick up the phone and call the labor and employment team at Butzel uh, to be to understand the specifics of what you're faced with. Good, Tom. That's great advice. You know, the next issue that we want to deal with is, you know, what do we do with vendors? And Russ, do you have some insight on that? Sure. First, you determine what your essential vendors are. Who, do you, who has to continue to supply? And if you don't, if you aren't absolutely need the product, um, then you revise, the, uh, revise your ordering process. Uh, again, communication is the key. Let every, you want to let everybody know what's going on. They know there's a troubled situation. And, so um, you want to make sure everybody's aware of what your plan is. And then do you have a, a, an option to resource a, a potential product or something that you need in order to continue to deliver to your customers? And so hopefully you already have resource options available, but if not, then that's something else you have to look at if your vendor cannot deliver what's needed. Another thing you might want to consider is if you have certain supplies or non-essential things that are on automatic delivery schedules, you want to be sure to change those because cash, again, cash is king and you don't want to be spending on non-essential items. Well, Russ, you've raised a number of issues there with these uh, vendors, especially those that are providing essential services where you have contracts in place and then you have concerns about the ability for your critical vendor to perform. I'm curious, Tom and Max, you know, what are the legal options if a vendor can't perform and, and what do you have to do to determine that? Well, uh, in, the, in the case of the vendor, uh, in, in, the, in today's times because of the corona, corona, this coronavirus, um, you want to make sure, well, you want to see if the contract contains a force majeure clause that would excuse performance by the vendor or uh, uh, mitigate damages that the vendor might have. Um, but if you have a uh, customer that is going to uh, reject that defense and, and either demand performance uh, or, or seek a termination of the contract, um, the vendor really doesn't, the vendor is gonna be limited in its options if it just doesn't have the cash to perform. And it could be faced with uh, the customer taking unilateral uh, measures here to modify the terms of the contract, uh, to suspend orders, 
It could seek termination of the contract. It could sue for recovery of tools. But on the flip side, if you're a critical vendor, then you may have some leverage with respect to the customer uh, seeking a termination of contract because that customer just isn't going to be able to move its business overnight. And then from the customer perspective, uh, uh, it's going to have a choice here, um, if, uh, you know, whether it wants to uh, move the business or uh, or stay with this particular vendor. Okay. Nancy, you got anything you want to hit there? Well, and and we'll go into it this a little bit more with uh, the concept of. Uh, dealing with uh, customers but if you have unsatisfied releases to somebody and they are legally unable to perform um, you do have the ability to modify or terminate the contract what is required of both parties in that situation is negotiations in good faith but they're negotiations towards a purpose which is to get uh, the essentials of the contract fulfilled so if if somebody tells you they're legally shut down they cannot operate due to the court order or government order um and there is an alternate source available you can go to that source notwithstanding what your contract says uh, again um this is a as, as tom said earlier this is a simplification of a complex area of law but uh um if you are in that situation, we would uh, recommend that you reach out to us. Well, Tom and Maxie both talked a little bit about their customer situation. Russ, what are some of the, again, the practical concerns, you know, from an operation and financial standpoint in dealing with your customers? Sure. Again, communication is the key. Um, one thing you have to determine is, are your customers still accepting parts or are they shut down? And, and if they are still operating, what do you have to do to meet the requirements, particularly if you have a contract? Can we meet the, the, the release schedule? Do we have enough uh, supplies from our vendors in order to build the parts necessary in, to meet the demand? And what manpower is necessary in order to, can you be on a part-time shift in order to satisfy the customer requirements? Can you do something part-time? Can you do swing shifts where you have rotating? And what happens if you can't meet the requirements? How do we uh, how do we incentivize the customer to continue to work with us? Maybe uh, uh, release schedules that are drawn out a little bit based on your vendors being able to supply parts to you. And, and another thing is what can we do to get paid? And this might be a situation where if we got paid early, we can pay our vendors early, they might be able to operate there's several ways that you can work with your customers in order to ensure that they're getting what they need. Yeah, customers are not really interested in shutting down their business. So, I mean, I think there's a, always a self-help solution in trying to deal with uh, the flow of uh, goods through the supply chain. Um, you know, one of the issues, Max and Tom, that you both raised is uh, force majeure. And I guess, you know, can you expand on that a little Share a little more as to, you know, what you have to do to assert that where it comes into play, and you know some of the issues that uh, people are faced with when you're in a crisis. Sure. So force majeure is kind of an overriding term used for three separate concepts. Um, first, uh, the parties may have a contract in the terms and conditions that deal with. Um, what happens when performance is uh, impossible. The term force majeure literally means superior force, which prevents performance under the contract. The good news is that excuses your performance under the contract if you truly meet that standard. Uh, the bad news is that there are negative consequences to that as well. In addition to your contract terms, any gaps that are not covered in the contract, or if the contract like, uh, Fiat Chrysler's terms and conditions does not have a force majeure provision. It, a contract for the sale of goods is covered by the Uniform Commercial Code and its concept of impracticality. Finally, um, for services providers, uh, there is a common law defense of impossibility to uh, the performance of a contract as well. 
So in any instance, you're going to be dealing with similar concepts of, of what has to occur, but you really have to start with your contract. Now, if you are in a situation where you are unable to perform for your customer, uh, you have a defense against the contract, but it is not enough that your suppliers are shut down. You have to show that you attempted alternative measures. It's not enough that um, performing the contract under the present circumstances uh, with the coronavirus and government shutdowns is um, excessively expensive. That is not enough to invoke most force majeure clauses. Instead, um, what is required is the continued negotiation between yourself and your customer. Um, both parties have to negotiate in good faith and what resources are available to you have to be allocated in a manner that is um, in, in, you know, as we lawyers love, and a vague standard called fair and equitable. Um, so it could mean that uh, certain things are given priority simply because of the urgentness of the production. It could mean that resources are divided equally. It really depends on your situation. And again, um, if you are in this situation, if your customers have releases at this time, whether for service parts or for production parts, um, you need to be in communication with them and you may need to consult with counsel to make sure that, that you are protecting your own rights. That's a good recap there, Max, because that is a very complicated uh, issue with uh, big ramifications, uh, certainly in the supply chain. Um, we're going to talk now about the uh, banks and lender issues and some of the practicalities um, dealing with your bank. So early this week, the Federal Reserve and several other regulatory agencies offered relief to financial institutions in dealing with what they refer to as troubled debt restructurings, which is essentially a significant loan modification on the economic terms of your existing uh, bank deal. And you know the banks have uh, many ways to accelerate um, the indebtedness that you owe them as business owner. They can declare defaults. Some of those are monetary, where you don't make a payment, and many are non-monetary, where they have covenants in their loan documents that allow them to monitor your progress in paying them back. They could be things like debt service coverage, debt to equity coverage, and uh, you know certain leverage ratios with debt to net worth. And these are all things that the banks use with good credit policy in order to maintain um, some level of assurance of collectability of the loans that they make to you. One of the issues that rises from time to time is that in many loan documents, the banks do have the ability um, to deem themselves insecure and um, assert material adverse change in the business clauses in documents that can cause an acceleration of your indebtedness. Now, I'm not suggesting in this coronavirus that the banks would act this way, other than to say that it's usually a provision in the loan documents which gives them that escape hatch. If they um, want to exit a particular industry or exit um, your business because you've lost a, a major customer or there's been a significant change in the business that they lent to originally. I think one of the other big issues that um, is a real concern for uh, business owners is the borrowing base erosion. You are going to see, like it or not, your existing receivables slip beyond the 90-day period, which means that they're probably going to fall off uh, your borrowing base. And I think, you know, during this period of time, it's incumbent to uh, express and communicate to the bank. Um, the collectability of those uh, accounts that slide beyond that 90 day. Some of those are going to be uh, critical customers to you with long payment histories and that the argument needs to be made that while the collectability of those accounts is delayed, there is some reasonable assurance that when things settle down that these companies will pay. And so again, I think you have to be proactive with that in the interim that may require an overline 
or it may require, um, when I say overline, which it's a, it's a funding outside of what your collateral base uh, pencils out to relative to the parameters that the bank sets forth as to how they view your collateral. Um, you know, the other provision is when banks deem themselves insecure, and that could happen for a variety of reasons, liquidity being lost, major customer being lost, something catastrophic, certainly that the coronavirus uh, has been responsible for. Again, I don't uh, want to intimate that banks will um, utilize those provisions, but they do exist in loan documents. From a regulatory uh, basis, and this is where I think we provide a lot of value to our clients, is really understanding um, what the bank can do in a workout situation and then ask for it. Um, a lot of times, uh, borrowers really don't know what they should be asking for and probably short sheet themselves a little bit in the relief that's um, needed in order to operate the business. Um, currently, under this new regulatory guideline, the banks can go up um, to six months with uh, various forbearance. And when I say forbearance, it could be payment deferrals. And I think I mentioned before, predominantly principal payment deferrals, not interest. Uh, there can be waivers of fees, and there can be extensions of repayment terms during this period of time. Most banks like to operate within 90 day cycles. That's typically um, associated with their credit reporting and uh, view of the credits. I think under these circumstances, the business owners that are on this call would all uh, recognize that 90 days is a blink of an eye and that nothing much is going to happen and that they should be asking for more time today to try to see if they can garner a longer um, relationship of forbearance during this period of time. So those are some of the issues um, in dealing with the banks. Um, you know, we obviously have a lot of senior lenders in our Grow Michigan portfolio. They've been acting very rationally and trying to deal um, with banks, uh, with borrowers' concerns but it's a function of communication. You have to really get a plan in front of them and tell them what, what you're gonna do during this period of time and how they're gonna be repaid. But you always have that situation where you can't make a deal. And so I'm curious, Tom, as to what some of the bank's remedies are in the fall. Uh, yeah, Pat, um, uh, the loan will be documented by a loan agreement that contains uh, various events of default several of which you've uh, discussed in, in uh, your presentation here. Uh, and, and, the, and the events of default are intended to minimize the bank's risk in any loan. And uh, uh, examples of events of the default would be failure to timely pay interest or principal, uh, violation of loan covenants, uh, material adverse change in the borrower's financial condition, and then we have a we have a really a catch-all in default, which is insecurity, uh, which would also be where the bank feels insecure with respect to the ability of the borrower to repay the loan, um, and that would give the bank uh, uh, rights to uh, enforce its uh, remedies under the loan documents. And so, if there is a if there is the occurrence of a default, what is it that the bank can do? Well, the bank can accelerate the demand payment of the entire loan indebtedness. The bank can terminate further lending under a, a line of credit. Uh, if, the if the borrower uh, maintains bank accounts with the bank, which is typical in a loan relationship, the bank can sweep all cash in those accounts and apply, those ca apply that cash to the loan indebtedness. Uh, the bank can also take action to or clause on other collateral, such as serving a notice on account debtors of the borrower to pay, to directly pay the bank. Uh, they can start a claim and delivery action to uh, repossess its uh, tangible collateral. And uh, it, can, it can seek the appointment of a receiver if there's real estate collateral involved. And finally, it can enforce its rights under uh, personal guarantees. And so um, the, the bank's rights are vast here. And, and just as a word of warning to borrowers, 
um, I realize that this is a tough situation. This is a tough time for everybody. But if you're thinking about attempting to divert bank collateral or convert it to your own use or whatever, or essentially just not turn collateral over to the bank after they demanded it, you could risk personal liability for a conversion or potentially breach of fiduciary responsibility. And that includes uh, things like depositing checks you get from the customer in another bank if the bank has what's called a dominion of funds over you. I would strongly recommend anyone who's thinking of doing that uh, to discuss it with a lawyer beforehand. Yeah, I mean, those are kind of next all uh, big issues. And I think, you know, the key here is that you have to be calm and not do crazy things that are out of, you know, the normal realm. And communication keeps everybody calm with some idea of certainty as to what your next move is going to make and how you're going to do it. But inevitably, things don't work out. And, you know, we wanted to cover today what some of the, you know, borrower's bankruptcy options are. And we've entitled it The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And I'm going to turn it over to Max Newman to talk about, um, you know, those alternatives. So I'm going to start with kind of a broad overview, and then uh, Tom is going to speak specifically to small business uh, bankruptcies. Um, and I'm going to start with the ugly because bankruptcy is ugly. It's the last option. It's very costly. You're going to have to hire counsel and you're going to have to hire financial advisors at a significant cost. Um, and it is really an option where you have one of these other parties that we're talking about, whether it is a customer, whether it is the lender, whether it is a landlord that um, is not cooperative and is not willing to give the time needed to uh, restructure your business. Uh, it also could be used if you need to sell assets or if there is financing that is only available to you in the event of a bankruptcy. Um, it is an option though. The good side would be that you can get the automatic stay. And what the automatic stay does is it prevents any collection measures from landlords, from banks, from any other party uh, against you without co further court permission. In other words, the stay is automatic and the uh, collection efforts require further court permission to do it. Um, filing bankruptcy would give you an opportunity to reject and be excused from further performance of burdensome contracts. So that situation I talked about before with force majeure, where the contract is not quite impossible, but it is excessively costly. In a Chapter 11 proceeding, you would have the ability to reject that contract and uh, either seek to negotiate uh, with the customer or give them back unprofitable work. And the situation I'm thinking about here is you've bid out a contract based on your capacity being nearly 100%. All of a sudden, the releases have dropped considerably because of this crisis, and you're operating at 30% capacity, and the cost structure just simply doesn't work with the contract. If your customer is not willing to negotiate with you, if there is no relief available, then bankruptcy may be your last resort to free yourself from a contract like that. It also gives you an opportunity to restructure your balance sheet. It gives you an opportunity to engage in a going concern sale of the business. Um, we have several other slides on bankruptcy. It is a large area and we have a short time. So I, I don't wish to, uh, to, to cover every aspect of it, uh, I would note that there are some slides on particularly on um, considerations in the current crisis uh, related to bankruptcy, and I would encourage people to take a look at them. The final thing I would say with respect to bankruptcy is if you go into a uh, bankruptcy, even in a crisis situation like this, there has to be an end game. You have to have something that you know you're working with, working towards, with counsel so that you can exit. Um, and one of our very last slides on here is something that I've been worried about, which is uh, restructure, uh, restarting production when all of this is over, because it's my belief that for many of you, that's going to be a capital intensive moment. And um, 
whatever the strategy is, it has to preserve cash and preserve your ability to, to restart and get your business operating in full again. And for small businesses, um, Congress has actually uh, enacted some helpful proceedings and Tom's gonna cover that. Thanks, Max. You know, the ex uh, our expectation is that you are gonna see a rise in bankruptcy filings or chapter 11 filings, uh, particularly by the hard hit small businesses. And under the bankruptcy code, uh, a small business is defined as a business that has no more than $2.7 million approximately of unsecured and secured debt. And effective February 19 of this year, uh, the, the new Small Business Reorganization Act uh, was implemented uh, that is designed to minimize the expense of bankruptcy for small businesses. So we think that there'll be a number of these businesses that will take advantage of that new act. Um, and the other expectation is that these companies will have little cash and may not even be operating uh, at the time of the bankruptcy. Uh, and their bankruptcy is really intended to buy time to obtain government assistance. Uh, you know, typically in a bankruptcy, a bankruptcy court won't tolerate uh, the Chapter 11 debtor not being able to pay its bills as they come due, or if it doesn't have adequate assurance. I'm sorry, insurance. Um, you also have uh, certain deadlines that a small business debtor must, uh, must uh, meet, including in particular uh, the filing of a Chapter 11 plan within 90 days of the bankruptcy filing, although under the new act, the court can extend that time if it finds that circumstances exist for which the debtor should not be held accountable. And I would think the coronavirus situation would aptly fit that um, uh, reason for obtaining an extension. Um, in addition, uh, you, have, uh, you have deadlines with respect to util short deadlines with respect to utilities having to provide them with adequate assurance within 20 days of the filing. And you also have landlords where beginning, at least beginning 60 days after the bankruptcy filing, you have to start making current payments. So it'll be interesting to see how much leeway bankruptcy courts will give small businesses as they seek loan relief uh, from the government. Uh, and I would also point out that um, in our opinion, that we believe that bankruptcy courts will look favorably on small business debtors and will not look favorably on those creditors who force the bankruptcy. I would share that opinion, Tom. Um, you know, in, in wrapping up this section, I, I think I just want to summarize a couple of things. First off, as a firm, we've always believed that bankruptcy is a failed negotiation, the result of a failed negotiation. And one of the reasons those negotiations fail is just lack of communication and the ability to try to develop win-win solutions with stakeholders that uh, really just want a reasonable approach to uh, the situation. Nobody can force you as a business to do something that you're not capable of doing, but every stakeholder wants to make sure that you are doing everything that you can do. Um, you know, my takeaway, uh, Tom and Max is, you know, while bankruptcy is an option, you can stay adverse action, um, but you need cash in a bankruptcy to operate. So it's not you know, foolproof in that way. And for the small business owners that are on this call, um, you know, it's the ability to fast track if you have debts with less than 2.7 million, which does get you through the process a lot quicker. But I think it was Max, you pointed out, when you enter into it, you gotta have an end game. Um, you know, whether you're trying to uh, get rid of burdensome contracts in some capacity or things that you need to uh, rid yourself up. Bankruptcy is a cleansing process, but if you're not sure, the meter when it's running is expensive. So you, you need to go in with eyes wide open. Um, we're starting to get uh, a few questions coming in. So I wanna open it up for questions. And I'm gonna throw the first one, Russ, at you. Um, you know, what kind of relief uh, do you think is available from banks? I know 
uh, as the chief operating officer at Grow Michigan, you know, you're getting an opportunity to see uh, what some of the banks are doing. Any insights that you can provide? Sure. So we've been in, at Grow, we've been in contact with all of our borrowers over the last week because everybody's going to have the same request. They need an accommodation. They know their senior lender is asking questions. So one of the, um, there's a couple of options that were discussed earlier, but just to recap, you ask for principal deferral. Um, continue to make interest payments. Banks are in much better condition, it, or are much better, are much more receptive if they're receiving their interest payments. Uh, potentially an overline. So if the if the borrowing base doesn't qualify you for additional funds, maybe the bank will allow you an overline uh, on your line of credit uh, for a temporary time frame. But but none of this can happen without a plan. There must be a solid plan on how you're going to survive with projections and everything. The bank is not just going to uh, respond to a, a, a request without a plan in, in place. And additionally, the one thing you want to do is you want to make the request while you're still current. They're much more receptive to a plan if you show them you're being proactive, you're making your payments, but you know trouble's coming and you want to adjust the payment plan going forward. Thanks, Russ. I think that's uh, you know, all good advice and things that we've seen over time that have, uh, have worked for, for borrowers. Every, you know, there's no business that goes just straight up in the air in terms of you know, sales and profits, and especially in the Midwest with uh, the various economic cycles that happen. Um, you know, businesses hit bumps in the road. And it's kind of ironic that uh, probably two of our best credits in Grow Michigan, um, in terms of providing information, were probably first to the trough to develop um, strategies of things they need going forward. And uh, in both cases, the senior lenders were you know, very good in handling those. Uh, Tom, we've got another question here. What kind of things do I have to document to claim force majeure, either under my contract or under the UCC? Well, um, as Max uh, explained in his presentation, uh, notice is critical here to um, the other party to the contract uh, to assert your force majeure defense. And in your notice, you'll have to you'll have to lay out your case as to why the events that have occurred constitute a force majeure uh, event, and then. Uh, being, uh, we think that uh, uh, it's important to be transparent here in terms of uh, if you have some ability to produce or uh, to spell that out, if you don't, you don't. Um, you certainly to explain the situation with your suppliers as well if they're having issues. But the, the key here is laying out your case for uh, force majeure. And at Buffalo, we have prepared a notice template uh, for our clients, and I would certainly uh, uh, recommend to the audience that uh, you either speak with your own attorney in regard to what uh, should be contained in the notice, or feel free to consult with an attorney at Butsell. Thanks, Tom. And again, I, I think, you know, I've seen that uh, letter that you guys and checklist that you have, and it's uh, it's pretty good relative to uh, at least asserting um, force majeure claim, which is going to be key as to how people react to it. Um, there was a, a question that was raised. And I think we talked about um, receivers for uh, real estate entities. Um, the question is, uh, can the bank request a receiver for an operating business? They can. Um, and. Uh, uh, the, the rules in the state courts of Michigan have been evolving over the last couple of years with respect to receiverships and expanding what, where they can be used and, and where they are useful. Um, some of the people listening in may also be familiar with the Sakti Automotive case, which is an automotive supplier that went into a receivership in southwest Detroit uh, that was done with federal court. And Receiverships have their own set sets of issues, and um, 
you know, it's it's really up to the banks whether or not they choose to use them in these circumstances, but certainly you can use it for an operating business as well. Let me just um, add to that, that uh, the, uh, the state of Michigan does have a receivership statute that uh, does address uh, 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 one of the bank's entitlement uh, if there's real estate involved. Uh, but the issue that we face is whether this receiver has the authority or the power uh, to sell personal property versus real estate. And the general thinking is, is that uh, he does not. So that's the limitation on receiverships if the purpose is to uh, uh, liquidate the bank's collateral. Now, Tom, just to expand on that a little bit, if that um, power and authority is given, is given within the receivership order, then wouldn't the receiver have the ability to sell? Well, uh, that's also something that we've discussed in the past, whether the parties can just agree that irrespective of the terms of the statute uh, to give that receiver the power to sell personal property. And again, um, it's an issue that has not been really resolved in the courts. Fair enough. I can tell you at the tail end of the last cycle, um, you know, the, the banks were generally looking to appoint receivers. And uh, I think there was a time that the judges were just tired of seeing their friends in the community losing their businesses and having the banks liquidate them. And oftentimes on the first hearing did not grant um, the motion for the appointment of a receiver to force both the bank and the borrower to negotiate some terms of release that would be more uh, acceptable rather than an ad adversary uh, proceeding. And I think, you know, that's going to be the practicalities again this time in that uh, everybody understands that this is not an industry problem. This is not a business uh, operation problem. This is a pandemic, which is nobody's fault and something that we all have to face. And my guess is, is that, uh, the courts are going to be a little more lenient on um, anybody being strong-armed uh, during this process. The receivership remedy, you know, is usually available when the stakeholders make the argument that there's some diminu diminution of the value of the collateral that they hold and want an outside party doing it. That could be a fraud or that could just be a, a declining business. And I just think um, the courts are going to force people to talk about it a little more than, than granting these receivership orders. We have uh, a, a labor question here, and I know Max and Tom, in all fairness, uh, you guys are not uh, labor attorneys, but it is interesting, and if you can't answer it, I respect that, but um, somebody asked, is there a difference between a furlough and a temporary layoff? And what they're interested in is whether or not owners are legally protected if they use the word temporary when it may be permanent. Well, I think in all, all situations that we're talking about here, and, and Tom and I are not labor lawyers, and I would certainly encourage people to consult with labor lawyers, but communication and honest communication is going to be paramount here. So, um, I mean, you can use the, the word temporary if you don't, if you don't know, and if you certainly, if you want that person to still at least potentially be available to you in the future, um, but I would I would try to be as accurate as possible in describing uh, uh, the circumstances to employees. As I understand it, furloughs are more contractual or specifically negotiated with an employee or employees, as opposed to layoffs, which are more of the legal based. Uh, letting somebody go at least temporarily um, versus a furlough where where you've offered something to the employees to um, cause them to take some time off away from the job. Okay. Well, I appreciate you taking a stab at that, yeah. Max, but uh, you know, Butzel has a lot of resources in the labor area and uh, I'm sure you've got a, a well-seasoned bench to handle uh, any more specific uh, insight into that topic, but I appreciate the uh, you taking a stab. Um, another question came out uh, about what costs that businesses are incurring that might um, fit into a business interruption plan. So I've looked at this for a couple of people, including a restaurant client. 
And um, at least with respect to the restaurant clients, the business interruption insurance had a no virus. We will not cover you in the event of, of, of a virus um, and, and a pandemic. So, uh, and, and that may be standard throughout all industries. I don't know. It certainly was, was standard in the restaurant industry, I discovered. Um, and so that's something to look at very carefully in your business interruption. Typically, business interruptions require some damage to the property um, covered by another part of the insurance policy. So, for example, a fire, um, vehicle accident, that, that kind of thing that interrupts the business. Um, it will be based on the specific policy terms uh, as to whether this circumstance where your government has ordered your business to shut um, will be covered. Uh, the extent of these expenses that, that may be covered. And then you have the issue of timing with respect to the insurance company, uh, because I think it, some of these insurance companies may be slow to write checks for uh, businesses closed down by, uh, by the virus. And I would just add, so while uh, business inter interruption insurance may be a source of cash, it's not gonna be an immediate source of cash. And what we're dealing with here is, is the need to find immediate sources of cash. That, that's a, a fair statement, Tom, because I mean, these are uh, survival instincts right now. And I would wholeheartedly agree by the time you establish causation and, and all the things, all the costs that are directly related to that, that will be an exhausting effort that is not probably going to be resolved for a year if you have to litigate your policies to determine what your coverage was. Um, I've got one final question and I'm gonna direct it to Russ. Um, somebody is interesting to know when you're talking about wage reductions, um, you know, what do you think is a fair starting point for um, key employees you wanna keep, but you know you can't pay them? What, uh, you know, the, the, the question whether 20% was a good number. What, what do you, do you well, from, a start, from a starting point, the business owner has to determine, you know, the key employees, who they want to pay. Um, but, you know, everybody can take a temporary cut. Um, it all depends on how you, how you formulate what the, uh, what, what are they going to get in return for taking a cut? You know, potentially you could pick it back up at the end of the year. It, it could, you could tie it to, the return of the business and how the business is is getting back to what would what would maybe the normal was before the the, the virus took over um, the world as we know it today. But there there is no rule of thumb as to where to start. Each individual business owner will have to determine what their um, pain tolerance is for continuing to pay and and keeping in mind that they want to keep the business open long term. And nobody knows how long this situation is going to last. And I, I would also add there might be some situations where if the company is providing for uh, application for some disaster relief where um, there's allocation either in the form of a grant um, or a non-recourse obligation uh, for the payment of payroll that uh, you know that could be a, a cause for a deferral until those funds are received from, from the bank. Um, we have as our last uh, slide in this presentation, a number of uh, federal and state uh, disaster relief loan assistance. And, uh, you know, for those that uh, need assistance, uh, all four of those sites are, are good. I'm sure there's other ones, but these are at least the ones that uh, we presented. And keep checking back with them because things are changing by the hour with respect to the programs that, that are available. So I think this is a good place to, to wrap up and I would say in closing, um, as business owners, you know, now is the time to plan and make tough decisions. And we have employees, families, and other stakeholders that really depend on our stewardship and leadership. And as the late U of M athletic director, Don Canham, once said, success is 90% planning and 10% execution. 
and uh, the resources at Butsell and O'Keefe are available to help you during this time of planning. And I want to thank everyone who is on this webinar today, and a special thanks to our panel for presenting. Thank you.